In this lecture, I'm going to provide an overview of the structure of exocrine glands in the body and some indication of the function of these glands. But I'm also going to deal with them in more detail where appropriate when I review the organ systems in later lectures. Exocrine glands are very important in a number of different organ systems. And it's important that first of all, you understand what a gland is and know that basically these glands form two major categories. They're either serous secreting or mucus secreting. You need to also understand the way in which glands secrete the components that they have made and how we classify glands or name them. And most importantly also, it's important to have some understanding of the duct system of these glands because these ducts within some glands modify the secretion product produced by the secretory cells. Now, there are a number of different types of glands. As I explained, I'm mainly going to concentrate in today's lecture on the exocrine glands. They're glands that synthesize, then secrete their products onto the surface. They do so either directly, such as we see in goblet cells lining some epithelia, or they secrete their product via a tube called a duct or a conduit. And as I mentioned earlier, some of these ducts modify the secretion of the glands. There are also endocrine glands. These are glands that synthesize their products, but then they secrete them into the extracellular space around the glands. Because during development, when the epithelium invaginated into underlying connective tissue, the connection between the surface of the epithelium and the secretory invaginated epithelial cells is lost. And so there is nowhere for these glands to secrete their products. So therefore, they secrete them into extracellular space and then those secretory products move into the bloodstream and delivered to target organs often a long way away from where these glands actually synthesized the material. Another way in which glands are classified or named is because often some cells can secrete products that affect their neighbours, and these are called paracline glands. These paracline glands secrete their products into the underlying interstitial space, and that diffuses to nearby cells and affects their function. We'll deal with those in another lecture. So basically, the types of glands are really classified on the way in which they secrete their products and also the way in which those products reach their target tissues, either through a duct, as in exocrine glands, or via the blood in endocrine glands, or just via diffusion along local interstitial space to affect neighbouring cells. It's important to understand how glands release their secretory products. And as I said earlier, in this lecture, we're going to concentrate only on exocrine glands. Well, there are three ways. In this diagram, there are three representations of the way in which exocrine glands or secretory cells secrete their products. Firstly, there is merokine secretion. Now this secretion, this form of secretion, this mechanism of secretion is probably the most common. The secretory cells make their products and they store their products within little membrane bound granules at the apex of the cell. And when they're stimulated to secrete, these little granules containing the secretory product moves to the apical surface of the cell. The membrane fuses with the cell membrane and the product is released into the luminal space 
by a process we call exocytosis. So that's merocrine secretion. Another way in which the cell gets rid of its products is by apocrine secretion. Apocrine secretion is where often the secretion product is stored at the apical surface, but then that apical surface or a component of that apical surface breaks off. And so what is released into the luminal space is the secretion product, but also a small part of the cytoplasm of the cell. And this is common in some of the glands in the eyelid and probably in the mammary gland. And the remaining form of secretion, the remaining way in which cells release their product, is called holocrine secretion. This is where the cell synthesizes its product, accumulates the product within the cell cytoplasm, but then undergoes programmed cell death. So the whole cell is lost into the luminal space. Holocrine secretion, we will see when we look at skin, when we look at the sebaceous gland in skin, where holocrine secretion occurs. Now, there are different ways in which exocrine glands are named or classified. First of all, if you look at the epithelial surface shown on the left-hand slide, the image of an epithelium in the gut, you can see single glands or single secretory cells called goblet cells. They look like a wine goblet. They're shaped like a wine goblet. And these are called goblet cells. They secrete mucus. They're an example of a unicellular gland, a single cell sitting in an epithelial surface all on its own. Although there are clusters of these cells all the way along the epithelial surface. If you look at the image on the right-hand side, this is an example of a multicellular gland. Here is a sheet of epithelial cells that are secretory, forming a number of layers. And if you look very carefully at this stomach mucosa, these layers of epithelial secretory cells, you can see that they stain differently. The surface ones are very clear staining. In the middle, you can see some cells that have a pink, reddish stain. And down the base of these epithelial layers of cells, you can see bluish stained cells. And that indicates that in this sheet of secretory epithelial cells, there are three different sorts of secretory products. So that is an example of a multicellular gland. Now I want you to remember the word mucosa that I've shown you on this slide, stomach mucosa. The word mucosa is a word, a term, I'm going to use in a number of lectures, particularly when we look at the organ system. So please remember that word because later on towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to explain what a mucosa is. I won't do it now because it's more important and more appropriate towards the end. But just remember that word mucosa. Okay. These multicellular glands can be, get far more complex than just a sheet of cells that you saw in that stomach mucosa. They can acquire a duct rather than just secreting onto the surface like a goblet cell or like these cells in the stomach mucosa. During development, when the epithelium invaginates into the underlying lamina propria, the portion that connects the invaginated epithelial cells to the surface is retained. And that forms a conduit or a duct. The deeper epithelial cells that have invaginated into the lamina propria become the secretory cells, the busy cells that make the secretion products. And so we can further classify multicellular glands of having ducts. And if the ducts don't branch, we call it a simple gland. But if the duct branches, like you see in the three diagrams down in the bottom of this slide, we call it a compound gland. 
Now, the classification can go further if you look at the nature or the shape or the structure of the secretory product. And I'm not going to go through all the names listed here. And I certainly don't want to emphasise these names or I certainly wouldn't expect you to be able to recall these names because in reality, when you look at sections through multicellular glands, it's very difficult to appreciate the three-dimensional structure and therefore be able to name the glands like you see listed here. It's very different though to needing to remember the way in which epithelia are named and classified 